Okay, uh, this is, we're going to do part A here first. So this is part A. And again, uh, try to avoid remembering having done problems that are similar. Instead, always go back to the concepts as far as uh, solving the problem. So when it asks me to find g of 4, I immediately went to this formula here. Said I can find g of any x value. So here I am finding g of x equal 4. Uh, so we plugged in x here, 4 here. Uh, I'm integrating f. This is the graph of f. So I can find that integral's value using areas. So I start at x equal 0. x equals 0. For these values of f here, values of f are negative. So all of this area will count negatively. Then the values of f switch to being positive here. We count this area positively. But those two areas, blue and green, are the same size, so they'll add to make 0. All that's left is this rectangle, which is 1 by 2. And then the triangle next to it, which is also 1 by 2, but being a triangle, you multiply by half. Uh, do that much, you get 1 point. Then I'm supposed to find g prime of 4. g prime of 4. So I have my formula for g. I must take the derivative of my formula. So here I am finding g prime of x means I must take the derivative of my formula for g, which is taking the derivative of an integral. So I'm using this formula here. So I take, here's f, here's f. I take f, plug in the upper limit. So I took f, I plugged in the upper limit. Multiplied by d over dx of that upper limit. I know it's dx here, because I'm taking the derivative of g prime of x. I always take the derivative with respect to the input variable. Uh, exact same process for the lower limit. You don't have to write out this purple work. You can do that in your head, just make sure you're using this formula. The result is g prime is just f. So g prime when x equals 4 is the same thing as f's value when x equals 4, which is 0. And one more point for that. Okay, now I'm supposed to find g double prime of 4. So take my formula for g prime, take the derivative again and discover that g double prime is simply equal to f prime. Therefore, g double prime when x is 4 is the same thing as f prime's value when x is 4. This is the graph of f. So f prime means the slope of f when x is 4. So here is the slope of this portion of the graph. Well, we're going from positive 2 to negative 2 on the y-axis. That's a drop of negative 4. Going from x equal 3 to x equal 5, which is a run of 2, I would stop there. That's one more point. So that's a total of three points for part A. Okay, now doing part B. This is part B now we're working on. Does G, got to be careful here, this is F. Does G have relative min, relative max, or neither at x equal 1? 
Well, we figured out in the part A that G prime is the same thing as F. And we know from Danica's chart, go here to x equal 1 on G prime, this is G prime, that we have this exact situation. At x equal 1, G prime is changing negative to positive, which means G has a relative max at x equal 1. And that gives you one point if you write that out. So you have to write out this box here, uh, virtually word for word. You can rephrase it a different way, but it uh, has to have that key information that you see in this box for that one point. Okay, suppose that f is defined for all real numbers x and is periodic, periodic meaning that the function f repeats over and over again. Uh, for example, we can see uh, right here from x equal negative 5 to x equal 0, the graph of f is exactly the same as from x equals 0 to x equal 5. So that's why they say that f is periodic with a period of 5. So we're working on part C here. Make a note of that before I forget. Okay. The graph above shows two periods of f. Yeah, I can see that. Given that g of 5 is 2, again, I'm not trying to remember another problem here. I'm solving the problem they give me. Find g of 10. Well, I have this again to find g of any x. So I'm going to try that. Notice how I stopped and got to work. I don't want to keep reading. I want to get his points as quick as I can. So let's go find g of 10. It's going to equal the integral from 0 to 10 of f. Uh, let's see here. So from 0, we did this earlier, from 0 to 1, f has negative value, so this area counts negatively. Then this area counts positively because the values of f are positive. So those two areas add to make 0. We already figured out that this area here would be, this area was 2, because it was 2 times 1. This area was 1, because it was 2 times 1 times a half. And then we keep going, because we're integrating all the way to, well, we're trying to get to 10, but we got to get to 5 first. So we integrate this, counts negatively. Uh, this will count as negative 1. So these two will add to make 0 again. Hence the integral from, so I'm write that down, let's see. So the integral from 0 to 5 of f, that integral is going to equal 2. Then because f is periodic, if we keep drawing f exactly the same way, the same thing is going to happen again. This area will count and we'll add to this area to make zero and just keep going. So that means the integral from zero to 10 would have to be four. And if I get that far, they'll give me a point. reading here, write an equation for the line tangent, 
So I go right to my notes, tangent line equation, 2g, got to be careful here, at x equal 108. So here's what I've got going on. I don't really know how this all looks, but it's this general idea here. We have some graph of g. We're at the point where the x-coordinate is 108, which means the y-coordinate there will be g of 108. And then the slope right here that's going to be g prime of 108. So I need to find g of 108. Well I know that this would be, let's see, this would be g of 5 is equal to 2. g of 10 is equal to 4. So there's a pattern here because it just keeps repeating. Uh, I just count it out. So let's see. Uh, that would mean that, let's make a little table. So here's x, and here's g of x. So following this pattern, You'd have 15 is 6, which means 25 is 10. And I'm having trouble counting here. So 35 is 14. So every 10 is 4, therefore every 20 is 8. So you'd have 55 would be to 22. Oops. Back that up. And so if 20 was 8, that means 40. has to be 16. So 22 plus 16 would be 32, 38. Go five, 10 more would be 42. And then we got to go to 108. So that's like integrating just three. So I come back up here and say, if I started here, this would count. These would add to make zero. Getting to three, uh, that's the same thing. That's just two more. So that would be 44. So I figured out that G of 108 is equal to 44. Uh, there's no requirement here to show justification or anything, uh, so you don't have to worry about justifying your work. So if you figure out that g of 108 is 44, they'll give you one more point. Now I've got to figure out g prime of 108. So, let's see. I remember from the previous part that g prime and f are the same thing. So that means g prime of 108 is the same thing as f of 108. So, looking at the pattern here, uh, that means f of 108 is going to fall right here which would be 2, because of how the uh, function just repeats itself over and over again. So if you find that, they'll give you one more point. Then we write the equation of the line tangent by writing on our paper y equals Let's see, the slope is 
2 parenthesis x minus the x coordinate which is 108 plus the y coordinate which is 44. Now you don't have to uh, write out specifically that g of 108 is equal to 44 and g prime of 108 is equal to f of 108 which is equal to, oh this was a mistake, I shouldn't write that, this is a 2. You don't have to write that out. If you have this equation, uh, that equation already contains the 44 in the right place, and it contains the 2 in the right place, uh, so they'll give you those points. So basically, this equation is worth a total of three points. One point for having the 2, one point for having the 44, and one point for putting it all together, the whole thing. So in total, part C is worth four points. One point here for finding the G of 10 that they asked for. And then three more points total for finding this equation. But they will give you partial credit if you find these pieces along the way. So if you find this and then you get stuck, you'll get a point for that. If you find this and get stuck, you'll get a point for that. A uh, second point for that. So if this answer here is not quite right, but either this part's right or this part's right, so this is correct or this is correct, they will give you partial credit. Okay. Rocket A, again, uh, there's no real feasible way to create a question one that is just like the question one that will show up on the retake test uh, because the questions are too complicated to invent uh, on my own so I have to go back and find old questions that are likely to be similar so this is where the practice test does vary from the actual test in that I have to give you new circumstances uh, that simply makes the practice test a little bit harder which is a good thing. You want the practice test harder than the actual test. So, rocket A. So, let's make sure we know what we're doing here. This is part B. Rocket A has positive velocity after being launched upward from initial height of zero feet. I'm going to write that down. The position or the height of rocket A at time equals zero is zero. In case I need that. The velocity of the rocket is recorded for selected values of time from zero to 80. So here we go, the velocity times zero to time 80. Okay, that's straightforward. Find the average acceleration. I remember on my golden notes I have a note for that. Average acceleration is simply the average rate of change of the velocity for the time interval 0 to 80. Make sure I indicate units. So, go to work doing that. I simply write down, let's see, don't have to write the word. The average acceleration is going to be, the velocity ends up being 49. Velocity was 5. So that's how much the velocity changes on average. Well, it's just how much it changes over that time period. Uh, that time period is 80 seconds. So right there, that's my average rate of change of the velocity, which is the same thing as my average acceleration. Just need to pay attention to where the units come from. So I've got feet per second. And that's being divided by seconds. And if you leave it like that, you'll get one point. You must have both the units and this fraction because it does say uh, that you have to indicate units to get that one point. Okay, using correct units, explain the meaning of this integral. 
in terms of the rocket's flight. So I just write the integral from 10 to 70 v of t uh, dt. Let's see. Let's pause for a second. So I remembered this from the golden notes. So that's going to help me explain because integrating velocity tells me the displacement, the change in the position, how different the position is. So I write this integral calculates the change or yeah, the change calculates the change in the height of the rocket Uh, whenever you're explaining the meaning of something, you've got to pay really close attention to units. That's why they told you right here, using correct units. So, this integral calculates the change in the height of the rocket in feet. And now I need to pay attention to the time period also. For the time period. Uh, 10 to 70 seconds. Again, must have units. So if you have that explanation, you have to have the units here of feet, units of seconds, you have to have the 10, you have to have the 70, you have to mention the change in the height. Can't say it's the rate of change, it's not. It's just the change. It's how much the height changes over that time period. If you have all that correct, they will give you one point. Then it says use a midpoint Riemann sum with so midpoint Riemann sum with three sub intervals equal length to find this integral. So let's copy this page to get a little more room. And I forgot to write on here that we're doing part E. Doing part E, copy that again. And let's see, clear this off. Part E. We want to do the Riemann sum, so we don't need this anymore. Okay, so we write the integral. From 10 to 70 of v of t dt approximately. Okay, don't be fooled here again. Be careful. That's why you're not trying to, you don't solve the problem like you remember doing it. You always use the concept. So we're going from 10 to 70, and we need three sub intervals of equal length. So don't draw here that will cause an uh, error. So don't do that. Draw in the middle of each subinterval like this. Three subintervals of equal length. So the first subinterval, I pick the value of v because I'm integrating v that is in the middle of the subinterval. The value of v that is in the middle of the subinterval. Uh, that value is 22. That's this. The dt or the change in time for that first subinterval is 10 to 30, which is 20. If you want, you can just write 30 minus 10. That's totally valid. Full credit for that. Plus, now we go to the next subinterval. The value of v in the middle is going to be 35. 
The subinterval length is again 20. Plus, now the last subinterval. Value in the middle of the last subinterval is 44. The length of that last subinterval is still 20. You don't really want to go any further than that. Uh, but if you get that far, checking here, making sure, they'll give you one more point. I mean, part E was worth a total of two points. Okay, now we're on part F. says consider the differential equation. Remember, just because they say consider a differential equation doesn't mean I solve it. But I pay attention. Find the particular solution, y equals or f of x equals, to the differential equation with this box here. So a reminder, when they give us a rate, is what they have given us because they gave us this formula dy dx. That's a rate formula. So we have a rate, and they gave it to us as a formula. They want us to find the formula for the amount. That's because they want us to find y equals something. Uh, we can use the fundamental theorem unless the formula for the rate includes the output variable. The output variable in this case is y. So we have to use the SASE method. So dy over dx. First step in the SASE method is always to multiply both sides by dx. It's kind of like u substitution. If you write this out as two functions being multiplied, sometimes it's easier to see how the separation actually occurs. Because this part here has already got the x's together. We've got to move this. So we're going to multiply both sides by 1 over 1 plus y. So if we get that far, it'll give us one point for correctly separating. Now we need to find the antiderivative. This is a little tricky. This is like 1x plus b. So don't let that fool you. If they were to put a 2 here instead of a 1, that's the b. This is the b. This is the ax part as you're looking at the antiderivative rules. So we're taking the antiderivative. We're going to change this to 1 plus y. So this antiderivative is 1 over a, natural log, ax plus b equals same rule, actually, except we don't have to do the expanded rule. So this is just natural log, absolute value of x, plus the constant. Get that far, they give us another point. So now we're going to find the constant c plugging in the initial condition. So when x is negative 1, y is 1. So I have the natural log, absolute value of 1 plus 1, must equal natural log, absolute value of the x, which is negative 1, plus a constant. So this is the natural log of, the absolute value of 2 would just be 2, so I'm going to use the bars. Natural log of 1. Natural log of 1 is 0, so I figured out natural log of 1 is 0, that, nat that c is equal to the natural log of 2. 
If I get that far, they're going to give me two points. Uh, one point for plugging in the uh, constant and one point for correctly finding uh, the value of C. So, you get two points to there. So one point for the plugging in, that's right here. And a second point for finding C. We're on to the last point. So this part F is going to be worth five points total. The last part is to isolate. So you come back to this equation. I'm just going to make a copy here to get more space. Racing here. Get rid of these. Okay, so we're taking this equation and we're going to try and isolate the y, get it to say y equal. Uh, this is the point that you should really skip and just move on. Uh, this doesn't look straightforward with these two absolute values. Maybe it is straightforward, I don't know. I would skip it, come back. Isolate sometimes can be very troublesome. Uh, in this case, it turns out to be not too bad because I can use that rule on your golden notes that says this. So the rule says e to the natural log of anything is just that anything. So at least the first step is pretty straightforward. Again, I don't like doing the isolate step. It takes too long for one point. Make sure you make this entire right half of the equation the exponent. It can't, like this half of the equation can't be e to the ln of x plus e to the ln of 2. That's wrong. However, now we're going to use this rule. e to the a plus b, the same thing as e to the uh, a multiplied by e to the b. So we're going to use that now. So we end up with absolute value y plus 1 must equal e to the natural log of x e to the natural log of 2. But using this rule, e to the ln of 2 is just 2. So the absolute value of y plus 1 must equal 2 e to the natural log of the absolute value of x. So again, we use this rule again. So the absolute value of y, see all this work is trying to get one point. And we're still not there. Okay, to get rid of the absolute value bars, we've got to get them on the same side. So we end up with this. And turns out that absolute value divided by absolute value is the same thing as this. So then to get rid of the absolute value bars, you have to consider two possibilities. You drop the bars, and it's going to equal this, or with the bars dropped, it's going to equal the negative of the right half. That means we have y plus, oops, so we have y plus 1 over x, oops, y plus 1, uh, 
divided by x is equal to 2, in which case y plus 1 will equal 2x, or y will equal 2x subtract 1. So we test it now. We plug in x equal negative 1. We're supposed to get a positive 1. Uh, that solution uh, will not work because if I plug in x equal negative 1, I'm going to get negative 3. So that's the wrong solution. It means the other solution is the correct solution, which is we drop the bars and consider this to be negative. Which is going to give us y plus 1 all over x equals negative 2, or y is equal to negative 2x plus, oops, sorry, minus 1. Which does work because if we plug in x equal negative 1, that turns out to be a positive 1 like it's supposed to. That was worth 1 point. That's why I say I do not want you doing the isolates, do not recommend that you do the isolate step. Uh, first time through the test, you should go uh, get more done first.